Um, as um, Pippa said, I'm a, a director of regenerative food and farming, which is a CIC set up to support um, people's knowledge, um, not necessarily just farmers, but everyone about the benefits of regenerative agriculture. And a side shoot is the gleaning network which basically reduces on farm food waste um right if i go like that oh yeah there we go um so when way back when i heard the ippc report um i did a lot of research on what would really make a big difference um at least locally but also globally and came across this regenerative farming thing because even on the first ippc report and at the first Paris um, agreement, there was a lot of talk around if we just increase the carbon within our soils by a tiny amount, that can make a massive difference globally because soil holds more carbon in it than all the green things and all the atmosphere combined. So if even just a relatively small percentage is increased, it's a massive uh, difference. Um, oh, does someone, that noise, does it mean anything I should know about? No, it's just someone wanting to be admitted. Just oh, fine. Okay. I'll let them in. Okay. Um, anyhow, so while I was writing a website um, around regenerative food and farming called regenerativefoodandfarming.co.uk, if you want to have a look, um, I came across gleaning. Um, <coughs> actually, an ancient uh, rite used to be, you know, a right of everyone to go and glean around the edges of fields that have been harvested. And it was um, written about in the Bible and was, in fact, one of the first known social welfare systems. Um, who's to know that if you were bearing one of those heavy sighs and you knew that they were hungry people locally, um, that in the olden days they might have left more for those to glean if there was, you know, uh, some sort of um, illness locally or there'd been a war or famine or something. Um, so it, it fell out of uh, the norm when um, land ownership sort of changed rather. Um, but I'd heard about it and I thought, oh, that seems like a good idea because in Cornwall you often see, you know, massive fields of, uh, what, you know, veg going wasted um and you know every bit of food is made out of carbon and it takes lots of greenhouse gases to produce it so it's pretty criminal really just to let it rot but i didn't get on with it until i saw uh, the simon reeves program about the poverty in cornwall and this guy um doug i think it's doug oh i've forgotten his name from the camborne food bank who cried um and i was like oh bloody hell i better get on with it um, and luckily I got a bit of funding um, and then I got a bit more funding and um, from relatively small beginnings, oh hang on, yeah relatively small beginnings, I've now got nine different coordinators across the county. Um, this is a slide showing um, a bit of the, the child poverty um, in Cornwall which is above average. Um, this is out of date now, it's probably worse um, and I believe at least last September, no, not last September, last spring, it was one in four in Cornwall suffer from food insecurity. So it's a bit, bit worse now. Anyhow, there's me on my first glean um, and uh, just used to put all of that in the boot of my car. Um, and it's just really good fun going out with a sharp knife. Um, and then it was, oh God, health and safety, risk assessments and doing health and, health and hygiene and all of that malarkey. And then um, more and more people sort of heard about it. Um, and this lady here, she's a gleaning coordinator for Mid Cornwall. Um, and I, I got enough money to be able to pay people, buy all the equipment. Um, and then we did a crowdfunder and um, I've now got two really cool pickup trucks, not very eco, but we, we have quite a few elderly people who do the gleaning and we drive around the edge of the field to pick up the crates, so which saves having to sort of walk miles with the stuff. Um, so let me see. So yeah, it's, it's grown and grown. We've got 300 people who um, have signed up to volunteer. We're feeding about 6,000 people a week, 
through around 50 to 60 different uh, food charities. That's food banks, uh, community kitchens and community larders um, and a couple of sort of um, homeless shelters. Um, we even go across to Plymouth and we swap some of our fresh food with stuff that Fair Share Southwest have got. So we get some different bits and bobs coming in. Um, uh, what I did find out having phoned the food bank in Penzance right at the beginning was that um, one of her recipients had just been diagnosed with malnutrition, which is uh, a bit shocking. Um, hang on, my phone's going. Let me switch that off. Um, and yeah so the problem is that they food banks often don't get very much fresh food um it tends to be dried because that's what people give um and the fresh food they get is often sort of browning bananas and um browning greens uh, you know lettuce um which doesn't have much in the way of nutrients and that was a mother who got diagnosed with malnutrition because anything healthy she got she gave to, gives to her children so that sort of just spurred me on further and um in the first year i think we did about 70 tons that's uh, 7000 no 70000 kilograms um and actually that equates to quite a lot of money's worth um and all this waste going back to the climate issue is obviously you know a bit crazy um well in the world um we waste around 40% of our food and in the UK, that's higher because um, we're not scrabbling around for food as much as many places. And you probably all know this overshoot day. This is the latest one where the UK gets to May the 19th. And then everything from then on is basically borrowing off our children's futures, which we've got to stop. Um, what I didn't know is quite how much do we waste at home, though. On farm is just 15%. Um, and in our homes is 70% of the food we waste. And hospitality, processing, transport and retail equates to that last 15% altogether. So we can all reduce our food waste. And that's not easy if you've got fussy children or, um, you know, fussy husbands. Um, but I find that I'm eating the most interesting things for breakfast. Um, and uh so yeah this this is the gang um another courgette glean and people love it you know getting out in the fresh air doing something that's worthwhile with a nice gang of people and that goes for working at um you know community farms as well anything outdoors just cheers your soul um that's a nice shot with the uh, mount behind and we go out in all weathers a bonus is that um, one, the people who glean are learning where their food comes from a bit more and a bit better. Sometimes I talk about soil health with the people that are out there. Um, and also the recipients are learning what to do with local seasonal produce better, including indeed myself. I got beetroot and I didn't know what to do with beetroot before. And now I do. Um, and that's a good thing. And pumpkins and squash as well. And um, yeah, so going back, we've got to reduce our food waste at home. And that could be your breakfast come this uh, coming Christmas. And now I want to show you something else. Just whiz through that one. Um, I've got to go to share screen again. And then I'm going, ooh, sorry, bear with. Here we go. Um, so this is the website I wrote. Um, Regenerative agriculture, it's basically a means of protecting the microbes in the soil because the microbes are the guys who enable soil carbon capture, um, the creation of soil aggregates, which are particles being clumped together by um, um, microbes, uh, bacteria, and then clumped into bigger blobs by um, fungi. Uh, also worms do that. Um, even the snail goo is good for clumping soil particles together. And then that is held under the ground, uh, basically because plants, I think I need to show my face on this one. Can you see me? Or just the screen? 
We can see you as well. Can see you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I know. I'm going to stop share so you can see my face because I need to do actions. <laughs> okay. So you've got your plant or your tree. It does photosynthesis, right? It takes that carbon out of the atmosphere and magically turns it into carbohydrates to make its body. What it also does is push through its roots carbohydrates, so carbon um, made stuff that's sugary, that feeds the microbes. And then in return, the microbes are fed and they're able to make nutrients available to the plants. So it's a two way mechanism. The plants are feeding carbohydrates along with some vitamins and some acids through the sugary, watery goo that comes out of their, their roots. They're called root exudates, if you want to learn about a new word today. Root exudates go down into the, into the soil to feed the microbes. And as a result, you've got lots of happy microbes if you have lots of roots living in the soil. Preferably, if you have a mixture of living roots in the soil, from different types of plants, then you get different root exudates feeding at different depths of the soil. And then you get a better mixture of microbes because microbes like lots of different types of microbes all working together because they have like this soil food web. One will nibble up a bit of leaf. The next smaller one will nibble up a smaller bit of that leaf and turn it into poo that something else will nibble up. And then so it goes round and so you get all these different nutrients available because the microbes are regurgitating it and they're turning dead stuff into your potassium, your nitrogen, your magnesium, all of that. Now bear that in mind, that two way mechanism and imagine if you um, if you put on artificial fertilizers which are the main foodstuffs for plants, that's nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus on the top of the soil, the plants are passively being fed. So they don't have to put out so many of those lovely sugary sweets, those root exudates to feed the microbes. And in, as a result, there's less food for the microbes. As a result, there's less microbes being fed and there's less microbes. So that artificial fertilizer is all very good for a short term, but slowly it reduces the number and diversity of the microbes in the soil. Meaning also that those plants are getting the main foodstuffs, the nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus, but they're missing out on the magnesium and the copper and the zinc and the calcium. They're missing out on that two way mechanism when when they suck up water from the ground that the microbes had made into good nutritious liquidy nutrients, they would suck up along with their main foods, those trace elements, but they're not doing that two way mechanism. They're just passively being fed their main foods. So they are missing out on the trace elements. So then you've got a plant that has the main foods, nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus, but it doesn't have the trace elements in it. So it's a bit weak. So then it gets attacked, right? And I'm going fast, but I can tell you all clever. They get attacked by pests and disease because they're a bit weak. And then, oh, the farmer sees this and goes, oh, let's put on some pesticides or herbicides or fungicides, whatever is needed. So the plant goes, oh, great. But then it doesn't naturally fight the pest or disease it hasn't isn't sending out antioxidants to fight those so oh guess what they haven't got so many antioxidants in the plants so it's a double whammy this artificial fertilizer malarkey because you've got weaker plants lacking the trace elements and lacking trace uh, uh, the antioxidants as well and guess what our cattle, our livestock are lacking them and we are lacking them too. And it's making us not very well. So then you put on top of this, this knowledge that we've got that um, since the 1940s and this sort of industrial farming revolution, the green agricultural revolution, as it's called, um, 
when they started doing lots of tillage on a bigger scale, tillage breaks up those fungal networks, breaks, kills the worms. We love the worms. Um, and microbes are really quite sensitive. And if they're shown out to the UV light, if they're put up into the light in a, in a tilled soil, they die. They don't like the light. So um, that, on top of the artificial fertilizers, meant that we've lost loads of microbes in the soil. Okay, so since the 1940s, our soil health, as we call that lack of microbes in the soil, has reduced at the same rate as our gut health. Uh-oh, now we know how important both of this is. It's like, whoa, everyone needs to know this. And that's why one good thing that's come out of this war and Putin and um, the massive increase in artificial fertilizers is brilliant. Less artificial fertilizers mucking up this two-way situation. And obviously they're really quite um, nitrogen carbon intensive to produce as well. So, and they create algae blooms and all of this. So um, that's good. We, we like, and we need good news. Um, and also more and more farmers are going down the regenerative path. Southern England farms, Riviera farms, they're both leaf certified. Um, a local farmer here, Mac Fadden, has put in some mixed herbal lays. Mixed herbal lays allow a farmer to have that mixture of different living roots in the soil. Because if you think about it, rye grass is a monocrop, it's no good. You've got the same roots at the same height of the soil. So you only get one line of one certain type of microbe around the, that root um, edge. You get lots of microbes basically around the roots because that's where you get these yummy sugars. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a whirlwind. Sorry to throw so much at you. Um, the main thing to realize is we are on the right path, but we need more and more people understanding that fundamental mechanism of plant roots, a mixture of plant roots, feeding a mixture of life underground. Um, the Germans, bloody Germans, they proved that if you have um, a mixture of seven or more species grown together, preferably of different family groups uh, of plants, then it enables them to become a quorum of microbial life underground that supports life above ground, even when there's flooding and drought. Basically, because you've got more of these soil aggregates, these more of these lumps of carbon, soil particles, it means there's also air around those particles and that air can enable more water filtration and more water holding capacity. If you've got no air in the soil, which you often get with compacted soil, or you get compaction if your roots are all just in one line, so you get lots of activity all in one line, so it doesn't go through. And you've, we've got, you know, lots of rocks as well, so we need to be building soil. And these microbes literally build, they make soil. Um, if you put down a bucket, right, and it's a little bit moist, you lift the bucket up after a few days and there'll be soil underneath it. It's like if you if even in the desert, if you've got a, a hoof print in a, a cow pat and that cow has eaten a seed and it's got a bit of moisture, hasn't it? And it's got a little bit of shade. So it's a perfect place for something to grow. And that's um, something that I would, if I had a billion pounds, I'd be paying this guy, Alan Savory, who's been doing this holistic plan grazing around desert edges, because that guy, if he could really be given the money to get the amount of money to support the farmers in Africa to reduce the desert and in fact, re-green the desert, then that would be helping us up here as well, wouldn't it? Um, so check out Alan Savory. Um, he does a really good TED talk explaining about how animals can be part of the solution. In the UK, yeah, there's areas um, that we can't easily make money out of um, currently, though Elms might change this, obviously, um, to make food out of unless you have some cattle and sheep to have that mixed uh, mixture of food being grown that will feed the animals. I'm, I'm waffling. 
what we've got here in St. Just is an alternative, which is a layered forest garden. So that's another way of making, having that mixture of seven or more species, creating lots of food. Um, but ordinarily, a step forward that we can encourage our farmers to take is to have that mixed herbal lay rather than a monocrop because it's more resilient to our droughts and our flooding. And because it means that the animals can be out longer, so that means that they don't have to buy in so much food when they're inside. And that's one message it would be good if you could take away and share. Another one would be if you know of any farmers that produce vegetables or fruit, then please let them know about the gleaning network because we're always after more. Um, we ha There's more food going out of food banks currently than going in and it's only going to get worse and there's also i don't know if you heard about this the new integrated health authority have created these community hubs um, which are going to become warm hubs so your local age concern or your local in penzance is pen birth i think pen is that yeah um are going to be places where people can go to keep warm those are also going to be able to feed people um, a midday something um, and so we want to try and support them so there's even more need from the gleaning network than ordinarily um, and yeah any questions we were going to say if you have a question could you put it in the chat but actually maybe if you raise your hand because there's not very many of us but thanks, Holly, that was brilliant. I think that the warm centres, there's, there's one at Pengarth and there's going to be one at Trenere as well. Some masses going on at Trenere. Uh, Leslie? Um, or just to say that St Mary's Penzance and, and um, other churches in our cluster are also working on um, warm spaces. Uh, we're still trying to attract funding and, and such like, but um, we've got our funding underway for feast nights for families at St John's uh, where schools will take it in turns to nominate families to come on a particular night and have a warm space and a hot meal and so on and we're we're trying to find ways of having some sort of food available in one of our churches each day of the week and so on we're, we're on the case and I should love to talk to, to Holly about it I, I'm church warden at St Mary's by the way um, they're so, doing brilliant things. I've I'd been amazed to. how the churches are shining um, because it seems so many churches are involved with helping um, on the front line. So well done. Um, I, I think there's a quite a good opportunity to also use these potentially um, as places where people can learn to cook. Um, learn to cook from scratch and learn to cook local, seasonal and cheap. We're doing a thing in St Just which is about that and so happy to share that. Um, I bought myself a slow cooker and yeah. so there is, I know Transi Transition Corn Mill, that's Anne, she's pretty hot on the funding side but the um, I don't I think only something like seven grand is allocated for the whole of the winter and probably Penn Garth um, and Trenere have got that I, I guess I don't know but there's more pots available for uh, religious groups I've just been going through Grin yesterday so I was like oh, can't do that no no <laughs> um, but I wish you luck with that if I come across anything can you put your email in the chat and then I can share your funding opportunities only because I'm going through all of it are you still speaking to me yes sorry Leslie right. thank you uh, yes, I'll try. I'm not very good at this this sort of tech. Thanks. Um, all right with you, Leslie. I can just pass your email straight on. Oh, oh that's, all right. that's easy. <laughs> Thank you. Shall I just show you something quickly as well? Just that's sort of thought provoking, perhaps. Um, I'm going to share again. Um, where are we? Here we go. This is what I was going to go on and then I needed to show you my hands. <laughs> okay, so this is the website I put together in lockdown. Um, and if you go, so this is regenerativefoodandfarming.co.uk. Regenerate you and yours. It's a bit slow, I've got too much open as usual. 
Um, oh no, it was this bit that I want to show you. What you can do. Um, because sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, isn't it? So, I'm trying to get rid of that over there. There we go. So, getting to know labels, um, it's kind of good that they've changed the law over uh, use by and sell by, but that actually means that there's less available in food banks. Um, so, that was one bad thing. Um, but yeah, your pasture for life is a really good one because obviously they're not being fed soya. And sadly, increasingly, there are feedlots in the UK, which are really ugly places. I had a fight with Tesco's. I said, you know, why aren't you on the regenerative path? And they said, well, they don't burp so much, this methane, if they don't live so long. I'm like, oh, my Lord. It's pretty shocking. Um, so Pasture for Life, RSPCA assured, obviously organic, but get this, guys. Organic isn't actually necessarily more nutritious because they can be doing monocrops. So you haven't got that mixture of roots feeding the mixture of microbes and um, they can be tilling really big, deep tilling repeatedly. So um, I'll share another slide with you in a minute to prove that because the Americans have proved how it's regenerative all the way that gives you that amazing nutrition um and you know your food should have on it and in it lots of healthy microbes very few microbes are bad for you um and your your stomach obviously since you were a child and putting things well since you were born um and then when you were little putting everything in your mouth has built up your gut health you have antibiotics or whatever and it goes dwindling down you have sugar and the bad nasty gut um microbes are being fed but and mine are mainly being fed by wine really bad um and, and in the future i bet they will be saying you know who's in charge here is it the microbes shouting for wine or shouting for chocolate or sugar or is it us who is in control because our our gut is um connected to our brain right so if we have bad gut health um it doesn't help our mental health um and you know ordinarily we should be able to cope with more disease and more you know chemicals in our food and chemicals in our environment but because we have we're lacking the gut health and mixture and number of different types of microbes in the gut we can't cope with these things and we end up ill we end up with you know basically anything to do with inflammation is connected to gut health 70 to 80 percent of our immunity is connected to gut health no most non-communicative diseases are connected to gut health that means your cancer your heart disease my arthritis a lot of autoimmune diseases, the majority, even autism has been connected to gut health in early years. It's freaky once you lo start looking at it. And it's amazing that doctors aren't taught this. In fact, I spoke to one doctor about three years ago who said everything he's done as a GP has been wrong and that he's just so annoyed. <laughs> but anyhow, I was showing you this. So I go off on tangents. So, oh, yeah. Holly, can I just interrupt? Do you yeah. prefer, I know Derek has a question, so he might want to fit it in here. Yeah. No, Pippa, thanks for that. I'll, I'll come back to it because it was about the, the food, some of the examples of how we can help people to learn to cook. But I'll come back to it, Holly, when you finish. Yeah, it's not easy. It, it, the problem is that everyone wants to do good, but it, uh, it quite often involves them having to hire somewhere buy the food, um, do quite a lot of research. Um, there is a thing that I'm part of, which is Sustainable Food Cornwall, which basically started off just working for no reason at all, except we need to improve the food that's on offer and available and being grown in Cornwall. Um, and so a little gang of us did a bit of research, talking to farmers, talking to retailers and fishermen and um, schools and colleges to try and find ways forward and asking them relevant questions. And then we 
So there's another website if you're interested called sustainablefoodcornwall.org. And then a guy called Matthew Thompson, who used to run 15, got together quite an impressive partnership group. Um, and we've been awarded something like £10,000 to pay a coordinator. The first two key areas that have been chosen are to improve uh, food in schools and to also try and uh, support smaller growers. But as part of that, I can see a sharing ability to share, you know, um, family friendly, cheap, seasonal, locally produced recipes. And um, if you've got any ideas, then please do email me potentially through Sustainable Food Cornwall or Regenerative Food and Farming. Um, because, yeah, it, it's a, quite a big piece of work that obviously we need to learn what to do with cauliflowers. <laughs> And cauliflower rice is a thing. Um, and, you know, there's also been a, um, just so you know, a, a project being funded by Cornwall Council called The Hive, whereby um, a building's being set up for to re um, repurpose excess food um, and not the food in our fridges, unfortunately, that's too hard. But some of the stuff that we glean and uh, stuff that uh, gets processed out because it's got like a tiny little spot on it or the potato is too big uh, for the crisp packets or it's too small to sell or you know this September I was given tons of potatoes because there was no market because too many potato growers grew potatoes at the same time and um, you know there's a need in our government Derek to better organize and help um, by going back in time really and having a potato board and uh, you know different organizers to make sure that there is an overproduction because it too much is left to chance as far as I can see. Anyhow, just before I get, stop sharing on this regenerate you uh, on this what you can do, um, obviously cooking from scratch, um, wasting less food, um, growing your own, not always easy, um, but also things like composting. You know, every village, every area should have a local compost scheme, um, and that needs support. Um, it's a, a it's a big issue because basically, if you can produce compost with lots of microbes and a good mixture of microbes and not the pathogenic ones, then you can reboot soil that has been um, has been. The, the veg has been taken out or the crop has been harvested because whenever you lift a crop you're losing microbes you're 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 reducing their number and to reboot those microbes quickly you can either put in a mixed herbal lay and some animals that have lovely microbial rich wee poo and saliva or you can put in a compost or compost extract and that's something I'd really like to explore more. And um, what we don't even know is where our waste is coming from, how much waste is produced in Cornwall, um, and then to sort of to utilise our waste better um, to do good for our soil is what's needed. Um, currently, it's crazy. We've got miscanthus being grown to keep anaerobic digesters going. We've got uh, food coming from Riviera that um, you know it's perfectly edible by um, animals and indeed some of it for human but it's all going into an aerobic digester and what the council are looking to do I'll stop sharing because I can't concentrate on that <laughs> what the council are looking to do is or being told to do by central government is that we've got enough anaerobic digesters in the county to cope with all the food domestic food waste um, but that's not the case um, but the council don't have enough money and I know you, this will piss you off Derek because you give them a lot but anyhow the council haven't got the wherewithal or money or whatever it is to be able to find out exactly how much waste is coming from where um, in order to better manage it and they certainly don't have enough to create a massive anaerobic digester so the plan is to send all our food waste up the a30 to devon oh. for a little bit of um digestate which is like um a dead uh carbon rich um byproduct of anaerobic digestion um which 
you know, we need the microbes. That's what I'm saying. Um, so any thoughts on that, Big T? Mr. T? Well, Holly, just to reassure you that I met with a group with the woman in charge of this whole program you just referred to, the waste food uh, and also recycling. I mean, it is, it's worth pointing out, we, we're getting a bit, we're getting a lot of flack at the moment, supposedly because we're rowing back on our commitments. That isn't actually true. Um, but it is in the Environment Act, the work that Holly's talking about in terms of recycling, uh, reusing recycling, but also the food waste. That comes into the Cornwall introduces that, I think, 2023. It's worth, but, but Holly, to, to solve your problem, which you quite rightly described, the council will be rolling out in phases. So there's going to be, if I remember correctly, I met the lady Esther about two weeks ago. Uh, it's about, there'll be about six phases where they'll be collect, introducing new bit, wheelie bins to people, in fact, which will be normal rubbish, will be fortnightly. In recycling, curbside recycling, I think, will still be fortnightly, and then food waste will be weekly. I think I'm right in saying that. And they're going to start, not unfortunately, not where we are. Um, so we're going to be quite late in the process. But they, but it, but it's not the intention to to take everything out of county. The council are very concerned about their carbon footprint and and creating a way of doing this. But you're right, we have no idea because I know actually the reason I was putting my hand up was twofold. Which, is, which you could help me with this. We don't actually know in Cornwall the sheer scale of domestic food waste, uh, how much, uh, and all, uh, because some people will be <coughs> finding other way uses for it around the home or garden anyway, possibly with the pigs if they've got them. <coughs> but, but the question I had for you, Holly, just to clarify, you set out food waste in various percentages, presumably the 70%, which was the household, that was a, the percentage of all food waste, was it? In the UK. <clears throat> yeah, so is a total about 10%. The total is about, is it? The work I did with Hive some years ago now, so it might have changed, was they were trying to find how to reduce food waste because of the impacts on the climate. Um, I, think that the, I think that food waste itself contributes 10% of our carbon emissions, something along those lines. It's but pretty do you know, high when you put on, in the production... No, the what? Sorry, the well, production. Yeah, if oh, you, yeah, you counter in, in the production, the fact that you've wasted the production. Yeah, agree. Yeah. But the um, but so the so so you were. So I was just want to clarify your figures earlier. So it was seventy percent was from within the household of all food waste. Is that what you're saying? No, seventy percent of food waste in the UK comes from the home. Yeah. Fifteen percent comes from on farm. And the rest, that's another 15%, is created in processing, travel, mm. hospitality, yeah, yeah. and retail. <coughs> so retail is a tiny sort of 3%, and yeah, we yeah. always fixate on that. But actually, it's right. pretty small. But um, George Eustace said that he was up for getting the retailers to pay charities to take their food waste away, because basically, mm. ordinarily, that's what you have to do, right? And yeah. charities being a sort of charitable type myself, fun, you know, trying to do these little funding applications for yeah. two grand to keep you going for a month and a half, 10 grand if you're lucky. Yeah. And there's less money around now to do more with, you know, we've got these emergencies yeah. to counteract. So we've got to get the system to somehow better pay to sort out the waste that they create. Yeah. And actually, well, if you take yeah. it further, we shouldn't be producing that food waste on farms you know 15% no. of all that massive amount if we if we had to this is a factoid if we had to um regrow and produce that food waste that we're creating in the UK we'd need nearly all of Wales to produce it yeah so mm. it's a large area required and um so me, something that needs sorting from a yeah. from the let Tesco's me, and the Sainsbury's. Yeah, let me come back on that because that's that you're right about that. But there is George within the just wants to do this, but I, I obviously I don't yeah. know how he is. How is but within George? the he's good within the Environment Act. Um, the, the, there is this principle of producer pay. So so actually we will see in supermarkets in all of their waste and also the people that were much earlier in the food processing they. I'm not saying it's it's going to sort out all the problems, but there's enormous incentives and pressure 
on to address this problem. But going back to 70% in the household, that is a phenomenal figure. And it's, it's the, the real challenge and partly why we have these sessions is actually to bring about that behavior change in a way that's really constructive and positive. So very, what I was actually getting at before I talked about that was whole again communities in Penzance who Jonathan will know well, they've been doing these online catering courses, which are absolutely such a no brainer and really clever. And what they're doing, which is so um, holistic, they're obviously encouraging people to use their own kitchens where that can be done, but they're providing the ingredients for the meal they're doing that day delivered to your home. So it's a really good scheme. And so there are examples of brilliant things that we should and could upscale. I'll just say one thing, and I don't really want anyone to quote me on this, but it's too late in the day. But when Liz became prime minister, I, I went not to see her, but to see her num next number two, to say that we should have a minister for hunger, which is actually in the public domain because we, on the select commission I'm on, we put that forward and that I wanted the job. I just think it would be, I think we could do it. If we had a minister for hunger that really could, all the things you're talking about, Holly, it would be just the right thing to do, whatever government's in power. We've got to focus on it much more. We have a minister for food or it falls within DEFRA, but actually a minister for hunger would be quite, quite a significant step forward. And if you look at what happened in Cornwall with the work that Andrew Yates, the, the vicar from Paul, has been doing around hunger and end hunger now, uh, there's some really good work where, the, and it's low hanging fruit, to excuse the pun, we could make quite significant progress quite quickly by using the food that exists, getting it to people that need it and supporting in a way that WAC does to cook it. But we ought to, I, I shouldn't be doing all the talking, so Can I, I, didn't, come in on I that? didn't get the Just... job when the Prime Minister's moved on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> God, Ollie. <laughs> He wanted to come oh, in. Sorry, I can't sorry. find my I can't find my hand raising thing. Um, just two. I think Minister for Hunger is a brilliant idea, and actually, to use the term hunger would rattle an awful lot of cages because so many people are able to look away from what is absolute, is actually happening. But uh, this is a bit of a. Um, I think the gleaning idea is brilliant. I wondered if you'd managed to um, encourage other counties to do it. Not on the scale of Cornwall because so much food isn't actually edible straight from the field. Um, we're quite unusual. There's a relatively big one in Kent and they tend to get lots of apples. Um, and there's small ones hither and thither. Um, but I have been trying to get more to do it. And there is, you know, it's all very well having a minister for hunger, but I see that ground up stuff is more it change, changes m more stuff quicker and there is through the sustainable food partnerships um which are basically all over the country there's emails of people sharing get best practice and forms and it's brilliant it's just too much for the likes of me to keep up with all the time but every county needs to support that sustainable food partnership and sustainable food place um because you know the ground it needs to come from both you know derek you need to get the funding down from the top and you need the people on the ground working with that funding who know what would work best in their place jonathan you've been patient sorry i didn't mean to come that's okay thank you holly I, I yeah thank you very much actually for a very clear exposition i've never seen such a clear exposition of microbes operating at different depths and all that sort of stuff brilliant <laughs> actually i think my thing is more of a comment than a question actually it, it, it's probably that you know so many of these things come about because energy is cheap because energy is cheap it's you know, people can't understand why it's expensive to buy food from the place down the road more expensive than in the supermarket when that's been all around the country, halfway around the world, some of it. But it is because energy is cheap. And and and, and now it's not. It, it's it, well, brilliant, exactly. really. Exactly. We're now getting the first tastes of what it's like for energy to be more expensive. And, you know, once that's actually happening with with fuel in vehicles, uh in a serious way which i'm sure will happen uh, then it is the topsy-turvy world that we live in 
uh, will actually sort of, well, it might write itself, but um, well, I think that's in a sense what governments need to be doing, preparing for that really, you know, recognizing that that transition is going to have to take place. And, um, and, and there will be loads of advantages to it. You know as well that's the other thing that, that so many things that that seem really difficult to do now well like, like organic farming or whatever will actually be much more viable than they are now it's cheap energy that makes them seem expensive um yeah that's charmian you know charmian jonathan yeah. she says you know it's an energy crisis fundamentally that we're in um and i I remember say, us, Derek, do you remember when we were in the car going over to a XR talk in Falmouth? And I was basically saying, well, we need it, just everything to be more expensive that's bad. And that's what's happened. Um, but we have to look after the vulnerable on the way through this transition. And that's what we're sort of talking about by helping people manage waste better and learning to cook from scratch better and feeding those guys and making sure they've got those warm places and keeping their dignity so that those warm places don't seem like shelters but seem like somewhere to go to learn something or get your puzzles out or you know there's something to do when you get there that's in, worth doing yeah um yeah the, i i didn't know about the whole again um communities doing that that's great Oh yes, the crazy Lizzie. She's mm. brilliant. <laughs> Holly, can I, Holly, can I, let me present, because it's a smaller group, I, I'm happy to be a bit more candid. Um, yeah. the, weird, the weird thing is that happens is that we have several groups in Penzance that are collecting food and distributing it. The whole again communities have to buy their food to deliver it to people's homes in order for it to for them to teach people in the evening how to cook and they do it as a family and then they when that's when that session's finished they put it on youtube so so if you've missed it or a fan wants to go back to it they can so what i'm what i'm the challenge really to penzance and it's very difficult for me to do partly because of the uh, politics i'm involved in is actually for some of these groups to work together more because actually there there are some groups that are collecting a lot of food and then another group that has to raise money to buy food to teach people to cook and they're using this like, we're talking about the same kind of food so if you're if you're able to connect connect with your gleaning to them they would do it when I mean, you know this they would do a menu we used to do it in helston when i worked for must seed you'd do a menu around what's available at the time yeah, yeah i should i i i met lizzie a few times um but she's never asked me so yeah. But because, I came across the road to the Methodists mm. next to the fish, fish and chips, um, and then obviously to Pengath yeah. and to Growing Links of Street yeah. Food Project. Um, well, <coughs> well, Penzance, well, just so you know, has got this woman working on how to decrease um, diabetes and chubbiness. Uh, apparently, it's one of the fattest places in Cornwall. <laughs> Jonathan, what have you been doing with everyone? <laughs> So they've got money to throw into a pilot to try and improve this. But what got me right, Derek, I was in the local Cape School talking about the great news that is soil. Could you kindly get that? Sorry. That is soil carbon capture and regenerative mm. ag and eating for the planet and gut health, soil health. Um, and um, so they were all like, yeah, great. This is interesting. But then I found out that they're eating shit, basically, sausage rolls and fizzy drinks. And it's so bad that the teachers no longer eat the food. So that made me go, Ugh! because, you know, this is going to be entrenched behavior. This is going to make them ill. This is literally going to not help their mental state. And the kids need hope. And they need the best bloody food we can get inside them right now because they have a really hard time. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are breaking under all of this and it breaks my heart to think that we can't do better and get them better food. So out of this, Derek, if you can try and get a better budget for school food, do you know what I did? When I found this out, I got in touch with the um, 
oh, Indian guy with a goatee beard who was in charge of education. I think he might mood. Um, Sadid, Sadid Khan or something, is it? Anyhow, sent, got in touch with him and said, this is outrageous. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> oh. Um, Get him away. And then what I got back was I got a tea towel that the government send out to schools with what they should be offering school uh, kids for their foods on the back. I was like, appalled. So that's why the Sustainable Food Partnership have chosen school food as one of their things. But we all need to lobby on this because some schools are doing okay. The primary schools tend to be doing a bit better, but the secondaries, you know, some of them, they can't, don't even have the time to queue up to get anything. So they go for some sort of, you know, um, panini every day. Um, here is coming back. You missed the crunchy bit. <laughs> I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, anyone, how we can improve school food. Derek, sorry to nag, but, um, oh, your internet's still bad. See, the government's literally breaking down. It can't get internet now. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Poor Derek. You're quiet. Muted. Oh. Oh. I'm just going to write him a note. I was just going to say on, on what you were just saying, um, Holly, uh, yeah. that once it's taken seriously, then there are techniques to be used. You may have heard of, of the nudge therapy and all. Well, it's not therapy, really. Nudge techniques. Um, and, and school uh, canteens are always like a, a quoted example, presenting the healthier options at eye level and the other things are still available but they're sort of much less visible and the, the government in the Cameron years had its, its own nudge unit to, that was using these techniques I believe they privatized it now but oh. <laughs> whatever nudging and also yeah, there's a book called nudge read all about it I will and I think we need to wag fingers at governors mm. Um, because it seems as though, you know, Michael Gove, bless him, privatising our schools. So your school works more as an individual and then it has to buy, you know, as an individual. So you're not getting that cost. Yeah. But so then they all go to Compass and these one other, I can't remember the name. And apparently they start off quite healthy. But the, they slowly reduce in their quality once they sort of get further into the contract and they can't get out. You know, the local guy here who's great, really wants to get involved with the community, the new head. He wants to buy from Basavan, but he can't because they're in this contract with these yeah. sausage roll pushers. Anyhow, problem is, you know, a lot of kids only want sausage rolls. Yes. You can't go to the lowest common denominator when you know that their gut health is needed. Mm -hmm. And once you know this information about that mental health connection through the spine and all of that, you just go, ah! But it's also what you were saying about training the gut as well. And if the children are brought up on beef burgers, somebody was saying that the YMCA in Penzance do lovely food very cheaply ah. but quite a lot of the residents don't eat it because they much prefer a mcdonald's so that's because yeah. their they guts have been trained yeah mm. and it's it's sort of sweet easy yeah i know and that's why you have to start with the young mums yeah yeah well, yes, I, I mean i think the um the, the trainer project are absolutely brilliant this is yeah. She's brilliant. I can't remember her name. She's an um, amazing cook. Yeah. There you go, Derek. <laughs> still silent. Yeah. Can You're you hear us? Can You're you hear muted, us? Derek. No? He's just hmm. giving me a ring to say his internet's playing up, so he's always back. Okay. Um, um, 
I mean, it is it is just gone past six. I'm aware of the time. Oh, so sorry. I... Yes, I've just sent this to um, Mr. T, um, saying any suggestions on school food. Um, and yeah, keep keep your nose to the to the grindstone on trying to find more food to glean. Anyone? Any farming contacts would be really gratefully received. Um, I'll put my email in just because it's the easiest one at Gmail. Anyway, Holly, that was absolutely inspirational. And just to say that WI is really good on food waste and um, food poverty. And so we give out lots of advice as well through our various networks on how people can can not waste food and can eat more healthily. And is also, that online at all? No, it's in the county news, which is just our um, county newsletter. In fact, I think the next one, we always have a green tips corner and the next one is going to be on forest gardening. So this oh. whole thing about planting at different depths. Yeah. Because um, of course, lots of WI members aren't particularly techy and they'd rather read something in a, in a publication. Yeah. So, so how can we look at that if you because oh, it's, like, it's it's online oh right um do you know helen castle no no okay is she um, didn't just one no she, well, she's the chair she's the chair of the Cornwall federation of wis but she's also very involved in food at trenere oh okay and also the various gardening projects at trenere so, uh, but because Helen I've got Kessel. Helen Kessel. Kessel. But, I'll remember uh, that name now. She knows all about you anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you've, I'm you've, really you've, dyslexic and names are like, E-S-T-L-E. -E. But I'm, I'm not sure if, if County News is passworded, in which case um, I probably ought not to give you the password, but it's... No. Um, I'm, I'm trying to become a member um, in St. Just. There's a right hoo-ha going on. Oh, Derek, you wouldn't know what goes on at WIs. Because <laughs> we've got the best building, but they're talking about selling it. And um, so the whole town's gone. <gasps> and uh, mm. there's a bit of old school versus new school going on. Mm. Watch that space. I don't know why they'd sell it. Because I know, it's they the best can't building. Use the money. I suppose they, they probably can't afford to maintain it. That's probably where that's coming from. I'm just trying to read something now. Um, the voting reform piece I mentioned is Good Systems Guide. Worth checking out. Unfortunately, I need to go. Yeah. Um, where do I find the Good Systems Guide? I'll send a link to it. Uh, okay, this, great. Uh, YouTube thing up, but we we should probably wrap up now. I think. Yes, wind it up. Romance night. Got to go. <laughs> well, well, thanks, thanks, Holly. That was brilliant. Uh, yeah, nice thank you so much for coming. Nice, say goodbye. Thanks, Holly. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye. Take care.